Okay, great. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to uh, EE240. Just a few sort of administrative things as usual. Uh, so, I'll be doing my review session for the midterm this afternoon. Uh, that's just at 2 p.m. over in uh, 550 Quarry. So, definitely swing by and uh, come with your questions and all that. Uh, other than that, just sort of do the midterm is a bunch of logistic stuff. So, there is no lecture this Thursday. Um, so, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold office hours. Not exactly at the same time as the lecture time, but almost. So I'll be holding extra office hours sort of from 9 to 10 a.m. on Thursday. Uh, I'll have sort of a break from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. just because I have to do some other stuff. But then from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., which is, again, the sort of normal standard office hour time, I'll hold office hours then. Uh, Pierre Luigi will do his standard sort of review slash office hours uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. I believe that's 2.30 or 3. I don't remember exactly, but same time as always. And then, of course, the last thing is the midterm in itself is indeed on Thursday. So that's going to be 6.30 to 8 p.m. sharp, meaning no 10-minute delay. Show up on time because we'll start on time. I want to give you guys the full hour and a half. That's just over in 306 Soda. Uh, by the way, for those of you guys who just walked in, there's lecture notes, homework number two and homework number three that we're handing back out. Uh, all the solutions and everything are up on the web. So hopefully you guys should be all set in terms of studying and all that other stuff. So any questions either on midterm stuff or material so far or what we've been talking about recently, which we just start on feedback. Anything anybody wants to bring up? All set. Okay, well, so like I said, come, you know, sort of prepared with your questions this afternoon because otherwise it'll just be me sort of standing there and you staring at me and, you know, you do that enough already. So, you know, make sure you've got some questions for this afternoon and we'll go through and do the review then. So unless there are any other questions, then let's go ahead and sort of dive back in. And last time we really sort of started talking about feedback. So as I mentioned last time, I'm assuming you've seen feedback many, many times already. So really what I'm going to be focusing on here is more a few of the sort of issues that you probably haven't seen before. So in particular, some of the trickiness you run into with stability. Yeah, question? It's just over in 550 Cori. Yeah. So in particular, for, the, uh, for feedback, we're going to sort of see a few of the tricky issues you're going to run into with stability. We're going to look a little bit more carefully at that than maybe we've talked about in the past in, say, like 140. And then probably today, and we'll finish up probably next week, we'll actually start talking about time domain settling. As I'd mentioned last time, we're going to look at that because oftentimes, although you're used to looking at things in the frequency domain, for a lot of the things that we're going to be interested in, we're actually interested in sort of the time domain fidelity of the waveform. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at that in more detail uh, shortly. With that, let's go, just go back into the feedback. So as I would mentioned last time, we can always, of course, sort of start looking at feedback just by looking at the generic block diagram. Again, kind of the thing that you might draw if you were a control person or a mathematician type of person. Or, of course, you just have some gain block AV, some feedback gain F. And, of course, the whole point of even doing this in the first place is that if you have a large AV, even if it's imprecise, then as long as your F is relatively precise, you can basically get the, feed, the overall closed loop gain to be very precise. Okay? So remember, you know, all, although we talk lots and lots about feedback, really this is the sort of this is the real benefit of doing feedback. It really just has to do with basically getting precise gain. Okay? Everything else is actually either a side effect or can be achieved without actually using feedback. Okay, So just keep that in mind. Now, I've kind of drawn this thing here just as sort of a reminder, because oftentimes when you see these feedback circuits, it's useful to remember that the closed loop gain is just going to be AV over 1 plus AV times F. Again, I'm assuming you guys have seen that many, many times before. And as we'll see in a second, usually the thing that's going to be sort of important here is that AV times F. That's what we're going to call often this T parameter down on the bottom. Because that's basically going to tell us sort of how precisely are we actually going to settle to that real final value we really want to get to. OK? So just keep that in mind. Because we're going to be seeing that, again, sort of fairly shortly, both from in the context of feedback circuits themselves, as well as when we start talking about settling and the types of errors that you get when you're settling. OK? But before we sort of dive in, there is one sort of interesting thing which we've touched on a little bit before, which is that 
oftentimes, even though we like to draw these nice, you know, mathematical diagrams with feedback loops, a lot of times the circuits we build don't map exactly into these block diagrams. Okay, so sometimes you have to be a little bit careful with how you build those block diagrams. So in this particular example, to see, you know, sort of what I'm getting at here, let's just sort of write out what we know should be the case. So what should be the closed loop gain for that circuit on the left over there? What is that supposed to be? It's an inverting amplifier, so minus R2 over R1. Yeah, it should just be minus R2 over R1. Okay, well, so now let's try and decompose this thing into our sort of standard feedback block diagram, right? So you'd kind of naturally say, okay, well, why don't we take this amplifier? That's the thing we're placing in feedback, so it makes sense to use that same amplifier in this block over here, right? And so now, if I draw sort of this standard block diagram, this feedback F here should just be basically the ratio between V out and this input voltage right here, which is what we actually feed back into the amplifier, right? Well, okay, unfortunately, as should hopefully be fairly obvious, the ratio between V out and this point right here is going to be R1 over R1 plus R2, right? And so as we had just said, if our sort of closed loop gain was supposed to be 1 over this feedback factor, and by the way, I'm ignoring the signs here, so don't worry too much about that, clearly 1 over this is not at all the same as that, right? Okay, so what's sort of gone wrong here? What's missing from our block diagram that we need to add in to fix? Virtual ground. Uh, virtual ground. Um, so how do I represent virtual ground? I mean, you could be right, but I guess I'm not sure how I do that in the context of, you know, pretend I'm a mathematician. <laughs> and I just want to draw this block diagram here. Uh, you're not subtracting the uh, feedback voltage from VI, but you're subtracting it from... Like, uh, it's not the VA from which you are subtracting the... So what are you subtracting it from? Subtracting it from... Backward. You're right, by the way. So now we just need to know what is it that we are actually subtracting it from. So what's going on here? What's, uh, you know, what's the sort of block I need to add to make this work? Uh, R2 by R1 plus R2 times VA. Ah, okay. Well, so... So let me maybe just expand on what you said. You're actually right. But so what Shiva was basically saying was, if I really look at this circuit, this point right here is not really the direct input of the overall circuit, right? It has some relationship to the overall input of the circuit, but it's not, you know, this VI here is not the same as that VI there. So what we really have to do is basically figure out what's the relationship between that virtual ground point and this VI, right? So what that basically means is what we actually have to do is actually add in another gain block, right? So we have our feedback circuit over here, which indeed I'm going to use with my same model that I drew on the side over there. Okay, now I've just claimed that the only thing I have to do is figure out what that gain right there actually is to make this whole thing actually work out, right? Okay, well, so as Shiva basically just said, that gain unit right there, if you kind of think about it intuitively, that should really just be sort of the voltage divider, right? Because if this is a, remember, just think of everything as being sort of incremental or doing a superposition, then I essentially have ground at the output over here. I have my input, original input right there. So the relationship between this input voltage and that point right there is just the voltage divider created by these two resistors, right? In other words, that gain block right there should really just be R2 over R1 plus R2, okay? So now the good news is that, of course, if I fix things up that way, then I'm just going to rewrite this thing here slightly. I'm just going to say that actually that's essentially R2 over R1 times F. Okay, and by the way, that's kind of a trivial substitution. All I did was, you know, divided F by 
R1 and multiplied it by R2 to end up with that, right? So now if you do that, now everything sort of makes sense, right? Because if my gain at the input is R2 over R1 times F, and this whole feedback loop here just creates a gain of 1 over f. Now, of course, we'll end up with our nice closed loop gain equation. Okay? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this just because, again, whenever you see sort of feedback circuits, it's very tempting to just sort of map it directly into this form here. But you have to be careful because oftentimes there's elements sort of quote unquote outside of the loop that you better be careful to actually include in your mapping. Right, so anytime you see something that's sort of outside like this, good guess that you're going to have to add some gain into the front end in order to actually account for that effect. Does this make sense to everybody here? OK. So again, I'm going to assume that you've seen these types of things you know, many times before. So what I want to do next is actually sort of take a look at, OK, let's assume we can decompose things sort of nicely into these block diagrams so we can think intuitively how to reason about them. Now let's see, you know, let's pretend that I just gave you some circuit. Let's say this, you know, example feedback amplifier that I drew over here. And so now what I want to know is, is this circuit stable? Okay? So to answer that question, I'm going to ask you guys. What would you guys do to try and answer that? How would you check whether or not this circuit is actually stable? Yeah. Plot the response and find the phase margin. Okay, so you said something like find the phase margin. Okay, that's a reasonable first cut. Anything else people know? By the way, let's just you know throw out all the things we can think of. What else would you want to do to check stability for this thing? Unity gain feedback. Say that again. Unity gain feedback. Unity gain feedback. Okay, that's okay. I mean, I guess we could place it in unity gain feedback. I mean, I think I've sort of defined some certain feedback right there, but, but that's okay. I mean, but specifically, what would you be looking for? So when you placed it in the unity gain feedback, what, you know, what would you be looking to have happen or not have happen? Oscillation. Oscillations, right? Okay, and so now, by the way, how exactly would you check if there's an oscillation there? So as an example, would you just take the circuit, put it in unity gain feedback, and then, you know, what kind of simulation would you do? Time domain. Time domains. You do a transient. Okay, well, so let's say you did a transient. Is that guaranteed to find what's actually happening? Put in a current pulse. Ah, okay. So you said maybe I put in like a current pulse and then see if that starts up some sort of oscillation. Right? Okay, I, I kind of buy that. Any other sort of tests or ideas that you know you guys have learned about in the past as to how you go about checking stability? K factor. K factor, okay. <laughs> Anything else, you know? The phase the... margin's with breaking the loop, right? Yeah, so phase margin is obviously, you have to break the loop to do that, right? And actually, as we'll see in a second, that can lead to some fun. You can do a pole zero analysis. Okay, you could just try and solve the poles and zeros. Okay, anything else? Open circuit time constant analysis. Uh, okay, I guess you'd kind of use that probably to do something like phase margin. Any other sort of margins people remember? People really like the phase margin. There's one other margin. Gain margin. There we go, gain margin, right? Okay, so all of these things, again, I'm assuming you're basically familiar with. If not, you know, we'll really briefly run through maybe one or two of them. But there's one thing that you guys should sort of notice here. So out of this list that we wrote, I don't know, maybe 75% or so of these things assumed that the circuit was LTI, right? So phase margin, gain margin, uh, solving the poles and the zeros, K factor, right? All these things basically assumed that the circuit was linear and time invariant. Well, OK. Unfortunately, neither the L nor the TI are true, right? So in general, circuits are neither linear nor time invariant, okay? So in reality, you actually have to be pretty careful when you talk about stability, okay? 
Because when you say something like, okay, this circuit has a certain set of poles and zeros, that's only accurate for some given bias condition, some given temperature condition, some given, you know, how they ran the process that particular day, right? So why do I actually spend some, you know, why, why am I pointing this out? Well, because what this really means is you have to be a little bit more careful when you talk about stability, okay, or when you actually check for stability. Right, so there's actually a couple of different ways that sort of formally that you could check, even for something that's linear and time varying, whether or not you consider it to be quote unquote stable. Okay, and I'll give you some examples as to why you might want to do something like that in a second. So the only sort of formal ways to do that for linear and time variant circuits is essentially to say something like the following. So what you're really generally interested in is does this circuit, essentially, no matter where I start it, always converge to some quote-unquote nominal point or some origin in the space that I'm interested in, right? And does it always do so within a finite amount of time, okay? Now, I've sort of used origin in quotes over here because obviously there could be multiple different bias points, right? Not only that, in fact, there are some circuits where the nominal bias point is not actually a point, but it's actually like some trajectory, meaning that it's actually, you know, jumping around between a bunch of different states. But maybe that thing is small enough and you know exactly what it is, and that's actually what you wanted the thing to be doing. Okay? And if you could show that the thing always converges to that, you know, small point or trajectory, then that's often what you really mean by the circuit being stable, okay? Now, another way of sort of, or another common way of referring to that is so-called bounded input, bounded output. In other words, if you put in some input that has a known finite size, then you can prove that the output will also reach a known bounded size within finite time, okay? These are kind of the common ways to actually think about stability for things that are not exactly truly linear, okay? So now, why is this important? Well, okay, so in practice, of course, what you are indeed going to do is basically take the circuit, linearize it about a certain bias point, and then use your linear checks for stability, okay? So that's, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. But remember, when you do that, that's really only an approximation. So don't forget that you should really do this analysis not just at one sort of nominal spot, but you should really move the circuit around all over the place. Right? So you should do it over different process corners, different temperatures, different supplies, and so on and so forth. In fact, you may even want to do some transient simulations as well. So some of the things that we talked about where Maybe you actually put in a big current pulse and see if all of a sudden the thing starts oscillating, okay? even if your linear analysis says that it should be fine. Okay? And by the way, you really want to keep these things in mind because many of the sort of fatal errors and fatal flaws that people have made in chips in the past were because there was some weird bias condition that they didn't exactly think about, but that could actually happen that caused the whole chip to basically not come up the way it was supposed to, okay? So I'll give you a very classic example. So let's say you take this circuit over here, and you go and you simulate it at 1.2 volt power supply. And you find, okay, great, the thing is perfectly stable, it has 60 degrees of phase margin or whatever it is, right? Well, remember, when you first turn the chip on, you don't magically all of a sudden get 1.2 volts, right? It may be at 0 0.3 volts or 0 0.4. It may have some, you know, ramp on the supply or something like that, right? Well, let's say that for some reason, maybe the circuit, even though it was stable at 1.2 volts, maybe it was actually unstable at 0 0.6 volts, right? Well, in that case, you might just get really unlucky. And while you're starting the chip, it might either start to oscillate or rail out as you ramp up the supply. And if you're not careful and you were relying on the circuit, let's say, to set up some bias or something like that somewhere else, if it gets latched up, it may be stuck, right? It may not actually come out of that bias condition. And then your whole chip is dead because 
you forgot to check what happens when you're in some other condition than what you originally expected the circuit to be operating in. Okay? So again, keep in mind that all the stuff that we talk about with stability, you know, and linear stability, you know, where we basically linearize a circuit and check the stability that way, keep in mind that's always an approximation. So you should always sort of twist your brain a little bit and think about what are the ways in which I could sort of excite this circuit that may break my assumptions, okay? Now, perhaps this is somewhat obvious for something as simple as kind of what I've drawn here, it's pretty straightforward, right? There isn't probably a whole lot that can happen that could go wrong. But by the way, even for something like this, let's say I start adding in some you know, current mirrors over here, and as we talked about before, maybe that current mirror goes to some other circuits, right? There could be all these sort of parasitic feedback loops that you didn't actually think about, right? That even if from a linear standpoint are stable, from a sort of transient or large signal standpoint may not actually be stable, okay? So just keep that in mind because, again, this is sort of classic way to, to get burned. And, you know, one of the reasons hopefully you're in this class is because you don't want to get burned. Okay, so that's kind of one of the goals is you should be able to come out and actually build stuff and make sure it works. Okay? Any kind of questions on this? Or? Okay. So, so let's say that we, you know, you did a good job, you checked all these sort of large signal weirdnesses, and now we're really just, we're focusing on how do we do that linear check. Because obviously if the linear thing is no good, then all of the other stuff is probably going to be no good either. So let's see sort of how we're going to deal with the linear thing. And again, in practice, that is oftentimes what you're going to spend some time really looking at in detail to make sure that that's okay. Well, so again, as I'm assuming you've seen many, many times before, in a linear circuit, the stability is always set by essentially that open loop transfer function, that T of S, right? So if before T was just AV times F, then T of S is really just allowing some frequency dependence in each one of those transfer functions, okay? And so, of course, if you're going to look at that T of S, the standard way you're probably going to do this is to somehow break the loop, right? So if you break the loop, that's how you can do things like phase margin, gain margin, etc. okay? Well, so by hand, that's usually pretty easy to do. And hopefully as you were, you know, hopefully you were taught, let's say in 140 or 105 or whatever it was, whenever you want to sort of analyze a feedback loop, whenever you're going to sort of break the loop in order to find this T of S, you always want to do it at essentially a high impedance, or to be more precise, an infinite impedance node in the circuit. So why do I say that? Why is it that you always want to break things at the quote unquote high impedance point. What's important about that? Yeah, right? So if I break it somewhere else, basically I could be screwing up the loading that I'm gonna get, right? So let's be you know, very specific about this. So if I look at this picture right here, hopefully it should be sort of obvious to most of you guys that the place you'd wanna break the loop is essentially right there. Right? But now we have to be a little bit careful when we do that. Right? So, when I broke the loop right there, what is it that I really meant? In other words, if I was looking at this small signal model over here, what, what piece am I actually breaking? What do you guys think? By the way, maybe just as a reminder, whenever you draw this symbol right here, what's actually inside of that box from a small signal standpoint? What's your sort of standard small signal model for the device? EGD, is that what we dropped? Ah, okay. So if I look inside of that box, it's going to look something like this. Right, there's going to be some GM times, let's say, VG. There's a VG right there. There's a CGS here. And, of course, there's a CGD right there, right? 
Okay, so when I claimed that I wanted to break the thing right there, if you were going to analyze this circuit, where would you actually, quote unquote, make the break? Inside the transistor. Bingo. You'd actually do it inside of the transistor, right? You'd actually say that, okay, well, I really, I want to include the effects of this CGD and CGS, right? If I don't include those, I'm actually going to get the wrong answer. Because if you think about it, CGD shows up right there. And of course, CGS shows up right here, right? So if I don't, don't include those, I'm actually going to get the wrong answer. Because in fact, this is really CS plus CGS. And that's really CF plus CGD, right? But analytically, that's not so bad because, hey, I can always just break the loop inside of the transistor. In other words, rather than making this VG and GMVG, as I've kind of drawn right here, I can make this be the feedback point, right? And I can include the CGD and the CGS. And then really all I'm doing is kind of breaking the dotted line from that feedback point to the controlled source, right? As an example here, what I did is I said I'm going to have a separate V test that I'm going to insert right at the GM. And then watch what happens and what comes back on that VFB, right? Analytically, perfectly easy to do. I have no problems doing that, right? So even though like this isn't really a quote unquote node in the circuit, this is clearly where you want to break things, right? Because if you do that break like that, you're not messing anything up, right? Okay, well that's easy to do analytically. And so if you did things the right way, analytically, this is indeed the small signal model you'd come up with. Okay? Nothing magic there. And again, really all I did was just, I have a v-test right here that controls that GM generator. And to find my feedback, I'm just going to watch what's happening on VFB. In other words, the T of S is just going to be VFB of S divided by VT of S. Right? OK, that's pretty easy to do. Now, let's see what would happen if I actually did this in simulation. Okay, so let's draw the small signal model I would get if I tried to do this, let's say, in SPICE. Okay? And so again, in SPICE, what I'm literally going to do is just break that connection right here, put a v-test right there, and then measure VFB. Okay? So what's the small signal going to look like? What's the model for that, which is probably what I'm going to do in SPICE? What's that going to look like? Start with the easy side first if you want. I have two kind of consecutive L's of capacitors with a voltage test source in between. Yeah, right. So basically, you're going to have, let's say, some RO over here, some CL over there. That, of course, didn't change. I'm going to have my GM. That's indeed going to be driven by my, my V test. But just like Brian was saying, Unfortunately, I'm going to have a CGD and CGS here. And of course, this is where my V-test is going to be. But now I'm going to have another path over here like this. And that's where I'm going to be measuring my feedback. Right? Well, this is bad news. Because clearly this ain't right. This is clearly not the same as what I intended to do, right? Now, this is completely a fact. This is completely just coming up because in SPICE, I have no way of directly getting at this GM, right? The only thing I can do is put a little test source onto the gate. But unfortunately, inside of that gate terminal, there's these other parasitics here, right? So this kind of sucks. Well, so what do you guys think? What am I going to do? How am I going to try and fix this? Could you just like make the entire small signal circuit in SPICE? Um, OK, you could try and do that. 
Um, unfortunately, that's <coughs> rather tricky, right? Because I mean, what you I mean, you could, I guess, but you'd have to go and like grab the entire small signal model, which, by the way, is not exactly just this. Because if you remember, CGD is not the same as CDG, right? So you're right. You probably could do that. I'm not so sure that you know by the time you were done with it, you'd be particularly happy with the result because you'd basically be rebuilding the BSIM model. So you could, but you know, I don't think you really want to do that. That's a clever one. I haven't heard that one before. Any other inductors. thoughts? Inductors. Okay, you said something about inductors. What do you think you want to do with inductors? Parallel. Inductors in parallel. What do you mean? To cancel out the. Um, to cancel out the impedance as particular frequency. Oh, okay. Um, you could. Uh, unfortunately, that still doesn't quite fix my problem, right? Because what I really need is somehow for this CGD to show up over there. And this CGS to show up over here. Or you can just add more capacitors. OK, yeah. So you can try and add more capacitors. I think that quickly gets back close into the sort of you know, rebuilding BSIM model. So that, again, you know, these, are, these are pretty clever ideas, actually. But you know, you know, inductor might not be such a bad one. Let's see Why if don't we can you do like break the source and add a voltage over there? Ah, OK. So let's, let's see if maybe let's, you know, you might be saying what, what I think is kind of the reasonable approach or what people often do. So let's see if that's what you actually meant. So let's just sort of draw this more generically, OK? So let's say I have some VN over there. And I'm just going to do some unity gain amplifier, OK? Something like this. OK, so now what I want to do is I sort of have really, you know, not only do I have sort of the loading, as an issue I need to solve. But actually, there's another sort of tricky thing here, right? If I'm not careful with how I break that feedback loop, I could mess up the DC biasing, right? And of course, if I mess up the DC biasing, the feedback loop is different, right? OK, so what I need is somehow to come up with a way of maintaining the same DC bias and somehow adding on sort of the same load. Right? OK, so let's see how we can potentially do something like that. OK, so I'm going to take that same unity gain feedback amplifier. And now, by the way, everything I'm about to talk about is really just spice tricks. OK, you only do this in spice. It's not that you actually build this circuit. OK? So I take that unity gain feedback amplifier. If I'm interested in sort of the closed loop response, I'll put in a DC V in over there. But AC-wise, it should be grounded, right? Because I'm about to sort of inject another signal and watch how it goes around the feedback loop, right? OK, so now next thing I'm going to have to do is if I want to make sure that the biasing is correct, the DC biasing, somehow I have to make it so that essentially this V out right here is connected to the feedback at DC but it's completely disconnected at all other frequencies, right? OK, how am I going to do that? Bias T. Inductor. OK, well, actually, you guys are all right in some sense. So you know, the, a bias T is actually what I'm about to draw, which uses an inductor. You could do it with a transformer, too, but you know, I'll just do it with the inductor, OK? So for those of you guys who haven't seen this thing before, a quote unquote bias T, well, OK, if you want two things to be connected at DC, put an inductor between them, right? Because at any other frequency besides DC, they won't be perfectly connected. Okay, there will be some impedance in between them. So now, what I want, obviously, is I want to make sure that this thing is really completely disconnected at any frequency I care about, right? So again, since this is just me and Spice, I'll just put a really big inductor there. You know, and to be clear, you know, like a Henry. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one Henry inductors, you know, the size of the table or maybe the size of my hand or whatever. Clearly something you can't actually build. But spice, who cares? You can put big inductors in. Okay? So now I've decoupled my V out from my sort of feedback terminal. Now the only other thing I need to do is figure out a way to actually drive that input with a test source. Well, OK, so again, at DC, I know that I want it to be connected to the output. But at high frequency, I want to drive this with my test source, right? Well, OK, what's the way I do that? I put a capacitor. 
And again, I make it a big capacitor so that even at really low frequencies, basically that test voltage actually gets shorted into the input right there. Okay? Okay, so now this is pretty good at solving the DC bias problem. Have I solved the loading issue or not yet? No, right? Because, again, at any reasonable frequency, all of the loading at this input right here will be totally isolated from that feedback point, right? And so, by the way, just to be clear, this is what I'm going to use, that V out, that's what I'm going to use to measure that feedback. That's going to be my, like, you know, the return part that I'll measure the TFS from. Okay, well, so anything else I can do, again, completely in spice, to try and fake this out a little bit, to try and add that loading back in? Use an order of the prior. Yeah, there we go, right? So usually the trick that people play here is they actually build another amplifier, right? So if I put that extra sort of dummy amplifier there, then at least to sort of zero order, I'm mimicking the feedback loading, right? Because now sort of that extra amplifier shows up as a load on the output right there, okay? So oftentimes, by the way, this is usually what people will do. This is, works reasonably well. We're almost sort of perfect, but we're not exactly correct. So what's a little bit messed up? What have we not exactly gotten right? What do you guys think? Don't you need to bias the second amplifier? Okay, so again, assume there's some V in right there, right? Which, you know, I've, I've drawn that as ground, but just pretend that that's an AC ground. So you'd have to, of course, you do indeed have to take the same V in as you used over there, because, again, otherwise the bias point is not going to be the same. So that's, that's true, but I think I can handle that. Anything else that's not exactly the same? Output voltages are different? Uh, that's a good question. So if I really have this circuit right here, and I looked at this circuit right there, will this V out actually be different than this one? No, no right? Because notice, this V out goes into that terminal, right? So I'm generating exactly at DC what the output voltage should be. At DC. Yeah, at DC. Now, obviously, at high frequencies, they're not exactly the same, right? So that's actually where you get messed up, right? So at DC, I've indeed generated exactly the bias voltage here. But now, this output over there, it's doing something else at high frequencies, right? So if there's any sort of let's say, either feed forward or feedback inside of this thing, again, we're not exactly doing the right thing. Right? It's not exactly correct. Okay? It's really close. It's, in fact, temptingly close. But it's not exactly correct. Okay? So the quote-unquote good news is... Oh, yeah, question? Uh, one more question. So don't you consider the loading on the virtual ground? That are the loading on the virtual like ground. Like you have to put a C big to the negative terminal of the op-amp, right? So, won't there be a capacitance loading due to the V out when you're breaking the loop? Uh, I think I've already got that, right? Because... No, that's only at the output, right? Right, but that I didn't move that. So that's still there. That's still going to load whatever this thing is driving, right? No, what I mean to say is, like, when you broke the loop, uh, at the V out, you have a loading due to the input of the op amp, which Right. Have, which you have added by putting a replica, another uh, right. op amp. But you will have a loading at the input due to the output. Which input? Are you talking about over here? Yeah, the negative terminal. Right. So I think what you're getting at is, again, if there's some sort of either feed forward or feedback inside of the amplifier, the exact loading conditions may not be the same. And that I agree with. <coughs> right? That's actually, that's correct. Okay. Right? So again, this is temptingly close, but not, you know, 100% correct. Okay? Now, by the way, a lot of times... <laughs> These interactions here may be small enough that you can kind of ignore it and you can sort of get away with this. But, you know, if you really want to be precise about it, this doesn't exactly work. Okay? So it turns out that actually, long before everybody was using Spice quite as much as they're using today, where obviously, again, you know, and analytically this really isn't an issue. It's just more when you try and simulate it. It's a big 
sort of annoyance. Turns out somebody actually came up with a way of dealing with this. Again, before even people really realized why this was sort of a pain to come up with. And this is now, I guess, 35 years ago or so. Or, yeah, about 35 years ago now. So the person who came up with a way to deal with this is a guy named David Middlebrook. And he actually did this back in 1975. Okay? So the way you do this is something like the following. Okay, so this control, this current source right here, pretend that's the controlled current source you're interested in. So pretend that that's GM VX, okay? Where it's labeled here, but just to be clear, I'll highlight it. Where sort of the voltage across here, that's this VX that we're interested in, okay? And by the way, you can add even sort of impedances from here to over there. But basically what you're interested in is, let's say, you know, in this previous example, over here I have some input from that amplifier, right? That input has some impedance associated with it. Let's call that this Z1 right over here, okay? So it turns out that the way you can actually solve all these problems, at least in principle precisely, is by following this so-called Middlebrook method, okay? And so what this Middlebrook method basically does is you calculate two transfer functions. Those two transfer functions you can indeed calculate exactly. Okay? So the first transfer function you calculate is this so-called TV. Okay? And the way you calculate that is you, buy, you put a test source, an AC test source, basically from the output back to the feedback terminal. Okay? So notice at DC I've done nothing wrong. Right? Because that's just like saying that I'm putting a voltage source right there, right? DC, it's just a short, so that's totally fine, right? Okay, so first I take that voltage source, I put it there, and I just measure V of Y, which is over here, divided by V of X, okay? Again, I just measure this in spice. Okay, that, you know, if you worked out the math, this is what you'd get. Don't worry about what exactly that is. That's not actually too important. Sort of the procedure is more interesting here. Okay, so I measure this so-called voltage transfer function. That gives me one loop gain. Next thing I'm going to do is actually return this thing back to being shorted together. Okay, just like it's supposed to be. But then what I'm going to do is put a current source across here. Okay? So now when I put that current source in, there's another transfer function I can measure. That transfer function is how much current flows into the input right there versus how much current flows into the output, right? Which, again, I've just labeled here as IX versus IY. Okay, so if then, then you go and you measure this transfer function, which, again, is just IY divided by IX. Let's call that TI. And, again, you can work out what that is. Turns out once you have these two transfer functions, you can do some simple math, which turns out to just be this, in order to solve for what is the actual loop gain. Okay? Again, I'm not going to walk through sort of the details of the math because it's not particularly interesting. It's just some simple algebra. Okay? So it turns out you can use this Middlebrook method to actually go and precisely solve for what the feedback ratios are going to be. Okay, and indeed, you can really do this in SPICE, so you can do this without sort of invoking any approximations. <coughs> now, by the way, the good news is if you think this is a little bit painful, uh, most modern simulators will actually, there's an analysis option you can invoke that will do this for you. Okay, so there's, for example, in Spectre, there's an STAB analysis that you can use that will do this. But even if you have an older version of HSPICE, you can, act, you can build up basically your own deck that will do this, and calculate the true loop transfer function based on that. Okay? Now, there's just a couple of things we have to be a little bit careful of if you were to really go about and try and do this. Or really, there's just sort of one main thing. So notice if you're going to do something like this, you have to do sort of two independent measurements, and then do some math on those measurements to really get the answer you want. Well. Anytime you have the simulator and you're going to do some math on a result that you simulated, you have to be really careful about the numerical accuracy. Okay? Because as an example, if let's say one of these things is either really small or really big, if 
there's any error at all on that calculation you did, for example, over here, let's say ti is something you know small and tv is something big, any small error on that ti will get multiplied by a big number in tv and show up as a really big error in that t, right? So basically, when you do this kind of thing, you have to be really careful that the accuracy of your simulation is high enough that you're not actually basically just getting garbage results in what you calculated. So by the way, you know, how, would you, how would you actually go about checking whether your simulation is accurate enough? You know, practically speaking, what would you guys do if you weren't sure if you were actually getting the right answer? Increase the tolerance and see if your answer changes. There we go, right? So what you'd always do is you go, you run your simulation, you get some answer. Then you go and you take all of your sort of tolerance parameters or all your accuracy parameters, turn them up by an order of magnitude, then rerun the simulation. If you get the same answer, good bet that it's basically accurate enough, right? If you get a different answer, you weren't actually accurate enough the first time, right? Then you have to go and turn up another order of magnitude or so to see if it's really good enough, okay? By the way, just to make sure, everybody has heard of RELTAL and ABSTAL and things like that. Raise your hand if you've heard of that before. Okay, good. So, you know, if you haven't heard of it before, go look up those parameters in HSPICE, or actually Inspector as well. They have to do with basically what are the relative tolerances on the simulation, or what are the absolute tolerances on the simulation. Okay, because remember, HSPICE is just a simulator. And so it always has some finite precision. And what those parameters are telling you is how long should you be running the simulations at each time step, let's say, or each voltage step? Or how much error can you tolerate at each one of those simulations, right? And if it's too large, for example, let's say you need a circuit, you have a circuit where you want to simulate like a picoamp of current. If your tolerance on the current levels is 10 nanoamps, clearly you're going to get bogus answers. Right? So you have to turn those parameters up to make sure that you actually get reasonable results at the end. <coughs> now, by the way, if you're lazy like I am, there is one nice thing about HSPICE, which is there's something called, there's an option you can invoke that's called dot option accurate. So if you just sort of throw that into your HSPICE deck, it'll automatically turn up a bunch of the tolerance numbers. Meaning it'll automatically try and give you a simulation result that's more accurate. Now, obviously, if you do this, it's going to take longer to simulate. Right? So not something you want to just blindly throw in. And by the way, in fact, even if you do this, that may or may not actually give you the right answer. Right? So if you have something where you're kind of worried about it or you can't sort of analytically or intuitively confirm that the result you're getting makes some sense, even after you do this, you should go and look at what were the actual settings it used, turn them up a little bit more, and make sure nothing changes. Okay? Make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So, let's say you solved all those problems, you know how to, you know how to use Middlebrook <coughs> method, or you know how to basically, when you can sort of get away with the simple, uh, common approach where you add the dummy amplifiers. But now, you know, finally, we really do have a transfer function that we believe in. Well, the most common way you will indeed check the stability, again, for at least the linear systems, is with something like the phase margin test. Okay? So, of course, if you're going to do that phase margin test, it's always essentially based on the Bode plot of the open loop transfer function, or T of S. So just to remind everybody and actually to sort of highlight some things that maybe you would have forgotten at some point, let's just go and sort of draw what one of these body plots would look like and just remind everybody sort of where things are coming from, okay? So let's say I look at the magnitude of T of S, of course, versus omega. If I have something that's going to be stable, then presumably I'm going to have one dominant pole somewhere over there. And then maybe another non-dominant pole somewhere over here, let's say near the crossover, okay? So let's say I've got my that's my magnitude transfer function. Of course, if you want to find the phase margin, then now what you have to look at is the angle of T of S. Right? 
Okay, well, so just as a reminder, if you have a first order system, meaning one pole, then essentially at that first pole, you should be getting minus 45 degrees of phase shift, right? Right at that pole. The overall shift, of course, is 90 degrees, and that happens over about an order of magnitude or so. But, you know, remember, right at the pole, minus 45 degrees. Okay, so now, assuming that second pole is sort of, let's say, far enough away, then what you should be getting is right over there. If I really placed that second pole right at the crossover frequency, and let me extend this axis down over here, what would be the phase shift that I'd get right at that crossover? 135. Yeah, minus 135, right? Okay, so just as a reminder, since there, you know, there seemed to have been some confusion about this last time, what this basically says is, if you want 45 degrees of phase margin, you better make sure that the non-dominant pole is at the gain bandwidth of the, of the open loop system. Okay? So a lot of times people like to just say, oh, they're separated by more than an order of magnitude. Order of magnitude doesn't mean anything. Okay? It's all about where is it relative to the gain bandwidth of the system. Okay? So as an example here, if you place that second pole right at the gain bandwidth, that's 45 degrees of phase margin. If you put it a little bit beyond that, you'll get more phase margin than that. Right? If you start pushing it the other way, of course, you get less phase margin than that. Okay? So as we're going to see, maybe probably not today, but probably next week, we're going to see it actually, it's useful to think of things this way, because it's going to turn out that depending upon where we place that non-dominant pole compared to the gain bandwidth, we can actually play around with the time domain characteristics of the settling response of the amplifier. Okay? And you're going to see there's actually going to be effectively sort of an optimal place for you to put that non-dominant pole in order to try and speed up the characteristics of the amplifier. Okay? And you're going to see that it's not actually putting it out as far away as you possibly can, which is a little bit non-intuitive, but we'll see why that is a little bit later on. Okay? So now, just one other thing, which indeed is something you'll encounter. So most of the time, we like to just do these sort of phase margin tests. And usually it gives us sort of fairly clean answers. But just as an example, what if I actually had a Bode plot that did that? Now what do I do? Am I stuck? Do I just, you know, raise my hands and go home? Or, you know, what do I do? Anybody remember or heard of this before? Yeah? If, so on the slide it says use the Nyquist test. Okay, so anybody know what the Nyquist <laughs> test is? <laughs> so you can read the slides, uh, you know, that's very good. <laughs> Find the number of times in circles the minus one. There we go, right? Okay, test. so again, for those of you guys who haven't heard of the Nyquist test before, that's basically, you know, if you really have a linear system and you're not exactly sure, because by the way, phase margin is really just an approximation, the only way to know for sure if the linear system is stable is the so-called Nyquist stability criterion, okay? And it is, indeed has to do with the number of times that you encircle the poles and zeros around the origin, okay? If you, have, you, know, if you don't remember this, that's fine. Go back, take a look at Grand Meyer, because every once in a while, you'll run into some circuit that indeed does something like that. And the only way for you to really verify if it works is essentially due to the Nyquist stability test, okay? So, you know, I mention it here not because I want to spend a ton of time on it. It's really just a reminder for those that that's something that you need to keep track of because it will indeed happen to you eventually. Okay? Okay. So, that's most of what I wanted to sort of spend time on in terms of feedback. There's a couple of other sort of, let's say, interesting scenarios that oftentimes will come up. And in particular in circuits, the one that happens most often is the so-called multi-loop feedback scenarios. Okay, and so let me just draw sort of an example of what I mean here to be more specific. So let's say I have some system that looks something like the following. Okay, so I'm going to have one sort of big feedback loop. But inside of that feedback loop, 
I'm going to have a second loop. Okay, so it's going to look, let's say, something like this. Okay? And we'll actually see in a second, this is more common than you may think. So what's basically going on here is I have, you know, this big global feedback loop here. But inside of it, I have another smaller feedback loop. Okay? Of course, big and small is just, you know, with my block diagram, with the actual circuit, you know, what's more important is, is going to be sort of up to you to figure out. Okay, so let's say I indeed gave you something like this. And by the way, you should translate this into sort of, you know, what circuits inside of these might actually be implementing these types of block diagrams I've drawn here. So if I gave you something like this, what do you think you should do? How would you go about sort of figuring out stability for something like this? And again, let's, you know, just, what would you do? Well, you know, I give you this thing in Spice, and, you know, what, what buttons are you going to push? Or, well, really, what analysis are you going to do first, and then what buttons are you going to push? What do you guys think? Look at each loop separately. Okay, so actually, that's not a bad idea. So if it was me, first thing I always do is check the internal loop just by itself. Okay, so why do I say that? Why might it be a good idea to actually check that internal loop just by itself? Well, if, it's, if it's unstable, the outer loop is also unstable. Ah, okay. So you said if it's unstable, the outer loop is also unstable. Is that necessarily true? Not necessarily. It's a good indicator. Okay, well, so actually, you're sort of right and you're sort of wrong. So it's not necessarily unstable, but this is definitely one of those cases where I'm betting you that if that internal thing is unstable and you didn't expect it to be, probably the outer loop will also be unstable, but not because of the linear system. Right? I can certainly build linear systems where the internal thing is unstable and the whole loop is stable. Okay? The reason I say that is because if this thing inside is indeed unstable, most likely from a large signal standpoint, from a transient standpoint, it's not behaving the way you expected it to. Right? So most likely that's going to mess up whatever the rest of the thing was just because you didn't expect it to be behaving that way. Right? So as an example, as you were waving with your hands, you know, if this thing is actually oscillating with I don't know, two volts of amplitude, unlikely that, you know, this A of S over here has any relationship with what your real circuit is doing, right? So that's actually the only reason I say, or maybe not the only reason, but that's really the main reason I say you should usually check that internal loop just by itself. <coughs> if that internal loop by itself is unstable and likely to really oscillate, good chance that the overall thing won't behave the way you wanted it to, right? Okay, so let's say you do that, you find out this indeed is stable. Okay, well, so if you do that, the good news is you can actually simplify things a little bit. Because right? remember, anytime you see some block diagram like this, you can always collapse that into one gain, which is the closed loop gain of that whole block diagram. Right? So let's just redraw that. So now I would have something that looks like V in right here. And now I'm just going to replace that whole thing with its closed loop transfer function, which of course is just going to be A1 of S over 1 plus A1 of S times F1 of S. Right? Now once I've done that, I kind of claim this whole thing is going to look, oops, That whole thing is basically going to look the same way I'm sort of used to in my standard block diagrams. Right? I have some forward gain, I have some feedback gain, and pretty quickly I can sort of work out the math for the overall transfer function. Right? Okay, so this can get sort of a little bit tedious, but is a useful trick. Because a lot of times this helps you sort of just quickly figure out what the overall transfer function really should be. And by the way, you can oftentimes play these kinds of games even if the loop doesn't exactly look the way that I showed it. Right? There's all kinds of other clever ways people can tie feedback loops. 
Sometimes they'll intentionally draw it in a way just to obscure what's really happening. Most of the time, you can actually play these kinds of tricks like this. Now, just to convince you guys that, you know, I, I don't just like block diagrams and to draw things like that, let's think about practically where might you run into some cases where you'd actually have these so-called nested feedback loops. Generation. Say that again? Degeneration. OK, degeneration is one. That's actually true. So you're saying I might have something that, let's say, looks like, I don't know, like that. And then maybe, I don't know, some resistive load. And then I'm actually going to tie that in feedback. That's actually true. Any other thoughts? Game boosted cascode. There we go. Prepared. Right? Everybody's favorite from the homework. The game boosted cascode. <coughs> right? We got a game boosted cascode that, let's say, looks something like this. And then, of course, I go and I mean and I tie this thing in another feedback loop. Great example. Right? Almost, you know, and by the way, you can almost draw this thing exactly in that block diagram form that I showed before and, you know, have all the same fun you had on the homework, right? Just maybe a little bit less painfully. Any other thoughts? Some really common things that actually I claim are, generally speaking, nested feedback loops? Multiple stage op amps. Yeah, okay, there we go. Multi stage op amps, right? Or even multi stage OTAs. So let's say you have something that looks like even like that, OK? And I indeed intended to draw three stages there. OK, and so you want to tie that thing into global feedback. Obviously, with three stages, everybody should be very, very afraid that the thing will oscillate, right? Well, guess what? Oftentimes, the way you solve that is by doing something like this, right? So you do something to either jump around a stage or create some feed forward path that basically makes a 0, right? But of course, nested feedback loop, right? OK, so I'm sure we can come up actually with tons of other examples. Again, this was mostly just to convince you that you know, it's not that I just like drawing you know, complicated block diagrams, but really this happens to you on a fairly regular basis. So any other kind of questions on feedback or things like that before we move on? Or? OK, so now hopefully nobody is afraid of feedback anymore. You're going to be free to use that and play with it all over the place, right? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So with that, let's go ahead and actually move on. Let's start talking about settling. OK, so as I had mentioned a little bit last time and today as well, the reason we're going to spend some time on this is that, again, even though most of us are sort of used to thinking of things in the frequency domain, at least initially, in many applications, what you really care about is actually the time domain fidelity of the waveform. Okay? So just to give you an example, let's say I had something like you know, an oscilloscope. right? And you need to build the little sampling head or whatever, or the amplifier that grabs the input of that oscilloscope and sends it out into the output. right? And so let's say you built some amplifier that you know, you'd played a bunch of tricks to maybe try and get some extra bandwidth, which oftentimes in the frequency domain means you have some transfer function that looks like this. Okay? So this is my h of s, and that's, of course, omega, right? OK, well, and so let's say in the frequency domain I say, OK, well, this is only, I don't know, 1 or 2 dB of peaking right there. Okay? If I plot this thing in the time domain, so and I'll just draw that, let's say, right here. So let's say I put a step into that amplifier right there. In the time domain, what's that thing going to look like? Yeah, it's going to overshoot and ring around a little bit, right? So now it's actually going to look something like this, right? And in fact, the narrower I make that peak, Right? And maybe the sharper I make that peak, the more and longer that thing is going to ring. Right? Well, I don't know about you guys, but you know, if I'm using an oscilloscope, that really bugs me. Right? I don't want to see all this other junk that's just coming from my oscilloscope. I want to see what the real waveform is. Right? Well, so in order to, to really understand that, of course, we have to look at the time domain response. The other application, which actually is another very common one where you really care about the time domain behavior of things, is something like an analog to digital converter, okay? which, by the way, usually consists of a bunch of switched cap amplifiers. 
Okay. So oftentimes what you're trying to do in that context is basically gain some signal up by a very precise amount. Because if there's any imprecision in that gain, it's actually going to mess up your conversion result. Okay? But you're going to have to do that within a certain amount of time. Okay? So just to give you an example, let's say that I was going to build a 200 mega sample per second A to D converter. And I wanted it to be a 10-bit converter. Okay? So let's take a look at sort of what some of the implications of that might be on, for example, the settling response of this amplifier here. Right? So let's say this is like my very first stage. Okay? So I'm going to be, in phase one, of course, I'm going to be sampling the input onto this cap. And then in phase two, I'm going to be flipping it on to the output right there. Right? And as we had said before, that effectively means that if I looked at this node right here, I'm going to create a jump, right? Which then, of course, is going to settle out to something eventually, right? Well, OK, so let's look at the output. Let me do this in a different color. So if I had an ideal OTA or an ideal op amp, what would we want this output to look like? What would be the ideal thing to have happen there? What do you guys think? Not a trick question, by the way. The output is the input gained up by. OK, well, so by the way, remember this input, I'm just sampling some voltage, right? Because initially I sample it on that cap, and then when I close this switch and turn on, or I should say, turn on those two switches. I'm just taking that charge and shoving it right onto the virtual ground, right? So if I had like an ideal infinitely fast amplifier, what would that amplifier do? <coughs> yeah, it would just instantly amplify the output up, right? So essentially, if I had the ideal amplifier, I would just get like a little impulse at the virtual ground there, right? Effectively, I just instantly, the output would jump up to be exactly let's say CS over CF times whatever VN was, right? OK, so now, bad news, you have real amplifiers. So what would the real amplifier actually do? What would that output look like, roughly speaking? The exponential with GM by CF. Yeah, so it's going to look like some sort of exponential settling, right? OK, so now there's actually a couple of interesting things that we should note here. So first of all, let's say I waited even forever. Will I really get exactly to, let me redraw that. Right, so let's say I just waited a long enough period of time, meaning forever. Will I really get exactly to CS over CF times VN? No, right? I won't actually get exactly there. So I've always got some finite gain. Okay? So actually, in this particular example, given that I want to build a 10-bit A to D converter, what would I want to make sure that, you know, how close do I want to make sure that I actually do settle to eventually? Roughly speaking. Less than half an LSV. Yeah, okay. So actually, both of you guys roughly said the same thing. You want to make sure that that error there had better be actually less than one LSB, right? Less than one conversion step in your converter. Because if it's more than one, then actually you don't get 10 bits. You get something else, which is obviously less than 10 bits. In fact, you really want it to be less than about half an LSB, right? So now I said that I really want that to happen if I waited forever. But do I actually have forever? To do this? I don't. Half the cycle. Ah, so do I actually get a cycle or do I get even less than that? Half. Yeah, I get half a cycle, right? So even if I have no non overlaps in my clocks, then the longest I can wait is about 2.5 nanoseconds, right? And that's just coming about because, of course, 200 mega samples per second means it's a 5 nanosecond period, right? So Really what we're kind of getting at here is that there's basically two pieces to the settling response that I need to worry about 
from the standpoint of settling, excuse me, of setting how accurate I can get the right result. Okay? So those two pieces are kind of obvious, right? One is there's just a static error that I'm going to make, right? Even though I wanted some very precise gain, I'm not going to get exactly that gain, right? So that's kind of the first component. And again, that one comes about for sort of a couple of reasons. So one is just, you know, even though I drew this as a nice ideal op amp, I always have finite gain there, right? So if I don't have infinite gain, I'm not going to get exactly 1 over f for the closed loop gain. I'm going to get something close to it, but not exact. The other thing, which by the way is, can be quite important, is even though I've set this thing up and you know, maybe I did a very good job with the layout and all that, so that I made CS and CF really track each other, there's always going to be some mismatch there. right? So of course, if there is some small mismatch in this CF relative to that CS, that's also going to mess up the precision to which you settle. Okay? But all that stuff, that's really static, right? That's just what happens when you wait forever. The other piece, of course, is that I don't instantly get to the value I want to, right? In other words, it takes me some amount of time before I start getting close to that real final value. So what this really kind of says is that now I have sort of these two pieces, right? In other words, I'm going to have some error that I get just from the static component, which is just what happens when I wait forever. But I'm also going to have another piece of error, which is just coming from the fact that I can only wait some amount of time, right? So in other words, what I'm kind of getting at is that you know, if I really want to build this amplifier and I want to ensure that I have some overall relative accuracy, then essentially I have to make the sum of these two errors sufficiently small. right? Because both of them are actually going to show up. Okay? And as actually we'll talk about a little bit more in a second, I now actually have some trade-offs that I can make. right? Because I can kind of decide, okay, do I want to make the static error really small and allow a bigger dynamic error? Or do I want to make the dynamic error really small and allow a bigger static error? Right? Yeah? Correct for the static error? Yeah, so there are certainly ways to correct for, if, if things were really static, there are certainly things you can do to correct for it. Right? Especially if it's something small. Uh, the trick there, unfortunately, is that oftentimes, you know, the things that you use to correct it, either there's all kinds of other errors that you're not really thinking of that you wanted to attenuate just by having gain, or even if you're sort of okay with all those, oftentimes to figure out what that static error is, you have to basically use the amplifier itself. Right? In other words, you can't be using it to actually convert an input while you're figuring out what that static error actually is. Like, for example, if you had an ADC and all the input amplifiers were the same, and they all had the same static error, would, would that make a difference? Uh, it certainly does help in terms of extracting what that static error is, right? Because you have sort of more information that's common to all of them. But remember, you know, let's say I'm talking about a 10-bit converter over here. That means that I'm interested in errors that are smaller than 1 over 1,000, right? So at that level, you know, any two amplifiers, even if I put them right next to each other and I'm really careful, they're probably going to be a little bit different. Now, you're absolutely right that you know, there may be things that are way bigger than this that is common to all of them that I could indeed sort of correct with some common mechanism. And in fact, if you look at you know, what a lot of people are doing these days, they indeed try and come up with ways of essentially calibrating these kinds of things out. So that is actually a quite powerful technique. You just have to be a little bit careful with it because you know, there are situations where either it doesn't work because something else is actually limiting you or because while you're calibrating, you can't actually use the thing. And you want to use the thing for some large fraction of the time. Right? But absolutely, those are certainly things you can do. But even then, really, it's going to kind of come back to this sort of budgeting process right? of just how much error are you going to allow to happen here and how much error are you going to allow to happen there? And how repeatable are those errors? 
So that's actually why we're going to spend some time here figuring out what's going to be the source of those different components. Okay, but for now, let's assume that we just we use this and we'll see sort of how we're going to make these trade-offs in a second. But we just come up with some budget. Okay, so we're going to say that in our case, let's say we want our total error to be less than half an LSB. So we're going to make, let's say, the static error one quarter of an LSB. And let's say we make the dynamic error also one quarter of an LSB. Okay, so this is totally arbitrary right now. We'll come back in a second and sort of talk a little bit about how you'd more intelligently make that allocation between the two. Okay? But let's say I do that. Let's just go through and look sort of piece by piece which, what the errors are really coming from and what that's going to imply about our amplifier designs. Okay, so of course, just because it's a little bit easier, let's just start out with a static error. Okay, so for static error, again, there should really be sort of no big surprises here. So I'm just writing sort of our standard closed loop transfer function here. The only thing that I'm showing that's a little bit different is I just rewrote it in a way so that it's clear that this C here, that's sort of the target closed loop gain. Okay? This piece right here, that's just 1 over T0, where T0 is just the DC open loop gain. Okay? The only thing that's a little bit important to notice here is that this closed loop gain may or may not be the same as basically the feedback factor you apply to the open loop gain of the amplifier. Right? Just like we had seen earlier with that resistively loaded amplifier, same thing here. right? Because the actual feedback factor is not the same as the closed loop gain. Okay? Where that feedback factor, by the way, that's this capital F that I'm talking about right there. Okay, so actually, let's look at this a little bit more carefully for this particular example here. So we know that we want the closed loop gain. Our intent is for that to be CS over CF, right? But remember, we're always going to have, let's say, just some input capacitance from the amplifier itself, right? So if I actually add that in right here, then my feedback factor is not even actually going to be just related to CS and CF, but I actually have to include that input cap, right? So if I just look at the relationship between V out and this VX right here, it's just a capacitive divider, but now unfortunately I have to add this CI, okay? So that feedback factor is going to be CF over CF plus CS plus CI, okay? So. I'm going to claim that this CI is really kind of bad news. Why do I say that? What's kind of bad news about that CI from multiple standpoints? The charge on the CS is not exactly CSV in during the sampling phase. Um, not quite. So turns out this CI over here, it's not actually going to change this result from the standpoint of, you know, if I made the open loop gain of this amplifier, if I made that infinite, I would indeed still get exactly this ratio here. I would still get exactly CS over CF. Okay, because remember in that first phase, the charge I sample on that cap is totally defined by CS. Okay? But it is actually bad in, for a different reason, for a slightly different reason, I should say. So why is it bad? And now, by the way, let's assume I don't really have infinite gain. What's, what's kind of bad? Yes, won't go all the way to zero. Yeah, so basically, because I added that CI over here, right, I'm actually reducing that feedback factor, right? That means that if I used to have, let's say, a gain of, I don't know, 10,000 over there, when I feed it back, if that feedback factor now is, I don't know, one tenth, my effective closed loop gain is only 1,000. Right? And clearly, as you increase that CI, you're going to reduce that overall F. Right? So that means that for the same sort of relative accuracy, I'm going to have to spend, I'm going to have to basically get more gain in that amplifier. Okay? So it's actually it's going to turn out, if you do the analysis, for actually almost exactly the same reason, having CI over there is actually going to increase the noise from your amplifier, too. And it's kind of intuitively makes sense, right? Because I'm going to have a certain amount of GM noise sitting out over there. 
And if that CI is big, my feedback is smaller, which means I get more voltage at the output, right? So in general, if you could, you'd really like to make that CI zero. Now, why is it that you don't actually do that? What's actually the thing that pushes you in the other direction? Matching. Say that again? Matching. OK, there is some matching. We haven't actually talked about that yet. Let's assume that you can do a good job of that. Let's assume that's not what's constraining you. Why else might you actually want to have a big CI? You need some gain, which means you need some W and some L. OK, I need some W and some L. I agree with that. But you know, I actually have some trade-offs that I can make there, right? So as an example, I can change my bias condition to try and reduce the size of that W and L. Why might I actually want a bigger W in particular? What's that good for? Uh, bigger W, I think, actually sort of hurts in some sense, right? Power. Power. How does it help me with power? You're like tra trading the bandwidth. You're biasing at a lower V star. There we go, right? So remember, if I choose a lower V star, that means my GM over ID goes up, right? It also means, of course, my CI is going to go up, right? So now you see why there's a trade-off. Because what I'd really like to do is have a very, very small V star so that I get really, really good current efficiency. But if I make that V star too small, that CI comes into the picture and basically screws me up, right? As you can imagine, this is indeed just one of the many optimizations that you would do to try and figure out what's really the best way of building this amplifier up, OK? So I think we're basically out of time for today. We'll pick back up with this uh, on Tuesday. I'll see many of you guys later this afternoon and certainly on Thursday. So good luck with you. Guys.